Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's 7.15. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. If I get everybody to take their seats. I do appreciate everybody coming, especially how how miserable the weather is. Hopefully it doesn't start snowing, but we are in Idaho, so. Um, we do start things uh, with stand up Idaho events with a prayer and a pledge, and tonight we're even gonna have a, a special singer do something, so Frank, if Frank Rios is offered to do our opening prayer. How are we tonight? Good. Well, let's just beseech the Lord for his goodness and his grace today. Lord, you are sovereign. God, you are in control. It means that you do what you want, when you want, using who you want. Father, we just beseech you right now for this nation. We beseech you, God, that your spirit would be poured out on this nation, that you would change lives, change hearts, Lord, you are all powerful and you can do anything. Lord, your word says that lest the Lord build the house, the builders build in vain. So God, lest you build this country, lest you build this world, lest you build this society, it is gonna be in vain. So we seek your face. You know all, you see all, and you are good. Lord, I want to thank you that your word is true and that your word speaks truth. And I just felt led to share Psalm 33 tonight. It says, the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men from the place of his dwelling. He looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works no king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. Behold, the, uh, oh, sorry. And on those who hope in his mercy. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. So Lord, we fear you. God, we trust you. We ask you now to move in a great and mighty way in this world and in this nation. God, I want to thank you for the great victory we had today over the, uh, the mandates, Jesus, and just the judge, the federal judge, putting an inju injunction upon the federal mandates. God, and I just, we rejoice in that. We thank you, and I know, and I give you credit for doing that and for answering prayers. God, we ask for forgiveness of sin as a nation. God, we know that the, the sin in this world and the sin in this nation has reached its full. And so just like in the Old Testament, God, the people would rend their hearts, they would seek after you, and you would change the situation if it was your will. So we just ask you, Lord God, to have mercy on this nation, have mercy on this world. God, we pray for the leaders, God, in this world. We pray for the, all the leaders in the nation. God, we lift them up and we ask for your spirit to move in them. We ask for your spirit to uh, change them. God, we pray for the candidates. God, we pray that you would raise up um, godly candidates, conservative candid candidates that care about uh, the family and that care about conservative values. Lord, we pray for the president, President Biden, God, and um, we just ask for you to move upon him, to move upon his cabinet, to change their hearts in their direction, God, and to uh, do great things there. God, we just pray for our representatives in Idaho. Lord, we, we know that, Father, you have lifted these people up your word says that you lift a man high and you bring a man low. So we just ask you, God, to bless the representatives, to move in their hearts, to move in our senators' hearts, God, and to uh, bring justice to our, to our nation and to our Idaho Congress. God, we pray for uh, our governors, God, that they would govern fairly, 
We pray that your spirit would move in them, that your spirit would lead them, and that they would lead our, our country and lead our states in a manner that is fair and just. God, we thank you for um, just working against the mandates, God. We thank you and we praise you for the great victory today. God, we pray for our schools and we pray for our education system that your spirit would, would uh, move and um, just bring great teachings in, back into our schools, biblical teachings and conservative values back into our schools. Lord, we just pray that you would come against the perversion in this land. God, in any way, spiritual perversion, uh, sexual perversion, God, just everything that's drawing us away from you, Jesus. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you're in control. Thank you that you have all things in your hand. And as I started out today, you are sovereign. We just lift up your name. In, in your name, amen. Thank you. Would everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And can I keep you at all to uh, please stand, keep, please stay standing. Uh, Alexandra uh, Garcia is going to sing our national anthem. <laughs> I'm going to pick it up. <laughs> Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight all oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming reminder is um, you know Tuesdays are not our normal day to meet but we are meeting again tomorrow for our normal Wednesday meeting and uh, Dennis Marson is going to give us a class on constitutional law I think everybody be really interested in that so I'd like to invite everybody I'm sure everybody knows what today is it's Pearl Harbor Day 80 years ago, today, 80 years ago, uh, we became under attack. It, it was an obvious attack. And, you know, World War II, there were over 400,000 military people killed, lost their lives in World War II. They sacrifice their lives for this country for what they believed in for our liberty our freedom the rights that we have they fought selfishly 
and they died so that we could have the country most of us have lived in. Our country is we're going through some really troubling times right now. And we have to recognize, and I'll just say it, I've said it before, we are again at war in my mind and in my heart. And we have to, we have to stand up and we have to push back and we have to keep our country. It is imperative that we do that for future generations and for the people that gave their lives for this country and for what that flag represents. And with that, you know, I just need to say this. You know, we can't let them or any of the others before us, literally the hundreds of thousands of people that have lost their lives, that gave their lives for us, we can't let them die in vain. Okay, to have died in vain. So with that, uh, our state is in a, in a bit of turmoil too. We're, we've got elections going on and all that, and we have a gentleman here that wants to be our governor. And Steve Bradshaw, Steve, I'd like you to come up. And tonight is his opportunity to come and tell us who he is, what he represents, thank you, and why he thinks he can be and should be our governor. And uh, like I say, and I tell everybody, ask the hard questions. Don't, don't be politically correct. You know, don't beat around the bush. Come out and ask him, and we will hold you to a, a good answer, believe All me. Right. So anyway, everybody give him a big hand. Thank you. My name is Steve Bradshaw. I moved to uh, North Idaho in 1988 from uh, a little small town in Texas called Houston. And I uh, got tired of big city, hunted Colorado a couple of times, wanted to live in the mountains. Had an opportunity to move to North Idaho and packed up the two kids, the wife, the dog, and a van, 800 bucks, and headed to Idaho. And been here ever since, have no intentions of leaving. Uh, I'm a full-time pastor of Coquilala Cowboy Church in North Idaho. Uh, started that in 2001. Uh, Bonner County Commissioner, I'm on my second term. I had no plans of getting into politics or into that realm at any time in my life. Uh, was not something that I thought I wanted to be involved in. but. The Lord uh, kept telling me run for commissioner, and I thought I'd, maybe I've eaten pizza too late in the evening, and uh, so maybe I need to revisit this. And then he made it very plain that I could either go to Nineveh or wait for the fish. And so I ran for uh, commissioner in Bonner County, the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. The Lord opened every door, put every person in place that needed to be there and run a second time and I'm still there. And the more I got involved, the more I saw the, the sovereignty of Idaho slipping away. And so I would go to the conferences in Boise and uh, I'd listen to legislation and I'd listen to different bills and stuff. And I would listen to the foolishness that abounds. And then I, being a commissioner, you're a recipient of a lot of that, federal level and state level. Eight months ago, ARPA money came to every city, county, and state in the nation. And the ARPA money, uh, arrived seven months in front of the instructions. The cities, counties, and states were all slobbering at the mouth and in a spending spree to figure out how to spend this money. And having been a commissioner for three years, it's like I told the other two commissioners, hey guys, we have not seen federal money come yet that there's not a string attached. 
let's not spend any money. And so we had the treasurer put 8.8 .8 million, which is what came to Bonner County, in a trust fund and wait and see what the final instructions and rules are. When we got that, my county clerk called me to his office and said, have you looked at these yet? I said, I haven't looked at all of it. He said, have a seat. And so he handed me a copy of this and we turned to the third page and it says compliance with applicable laws and regulations. The first sentence says recipient agrees to comply with the requirements of section 603 of the act which is Social Security Act. Regulations adopted by the Treasury pursuant to section 603 F. I read down through that way past F and it has absolutely nothing to do with ARPA money. It's just part of standard federal language and their instructions and contracts. And guidance issued by the Treasury regarding the foregoing period. Now a new sentence starts. When the new sentence starts, a new subject line begins. Recipients also agrees to comply with all other applicable federal statutes, regulations, and executive orders. That is not standard language in any ARPA, any CARES Act money, any federal grants, any FAA grants, road grants, in any of the federal monies that has ever come down the pipe. That is not in there. It did not fall off the desk and land in the printing machine by accident. It is a treble three-pointed hook that's attached to these. It says executive orders and recipients shall provide for such compliance by other parties in any agreements it enters into with other parties relating to this award. You go on down to paragraph 14 and it says debts owed the federal government. Any funds paid to the recipient in excess of the amount to which recipient is finally determined to be authorized to retain under the terms of this award that are determined by the Treasury Office of Inspector General, not proven, not substantiated with facts or evidence, but determined by the inspector to have been misused that are determined by the Treasury to be subject to a repayment obligation pursuant to Section 603E of the Act and have not been repaid by recipients shall constitute a debt to the federal government. Any debts determined to be owed the federal government must be paid promptly. Recipient, a debt is delinquent if it has not been paid by the date specified in the initial written demand for payment unless other satisfactory arrangements have been made or if the recipient knowingly or improperly retains funds that are a debt as defined in paragraph 14a. Treasury will take any actions available to it to collect such a debt. Now that allows the federal government to look at your city, your county, or the entire state and go, you know guys, I know you thought that's what we meant to spend the money on, but that's not what we really meant. So now we want it back and the language in this allows them to go, we want it back now or by Friday or by the end of the month. It's strictly up to them. And you go back to paragraph 9, that second sentence leaves a wide open gap for them to come down with any federal mandate under an executive order for any reason, for anything. There's no specifications to it. They can come and say, okay, Idaho Falls. Everybody in Idaho Falls that works for the city and the county and the state 
will have a vaccination and will wear a mask, which is what we expect them to say, right? But it's not limited to that. There's no limitations on it. They could say, and they're going to drive a yellow Chevy. There's nothing that prevents them from doing that. Now, the kicker for me was they sent $8.8 .8 million to Bonner County. It's the same percentage based on populace for the cities, the counties, and the states. So Boise, with its bigger population, is going to have a much bigger check. The hidden treasure in all this is 8.8 .8 million is approximately four times more than the county can legally have in reserve. Now, if they determine you did not use it the way we intended it to and we want it back today, there is no way on planet Earth Bonner County can produce that money. It is not happening. And the Treasury Department will take any action available to it to collect such a debt. Anybody in here familiar with IRS income tax laws? If you owe income tax money, or you've cheated on your income tax and they found out, or you didn't file, what is the limitations that they have in collecting that from you? Short of hanging you in the front yard, there is no limitations. So that would immediately bankrupt the cities, the counties, in every state in the United States of America. Is that possible? That the federal government accidentally put that executive order line in there? The printer just magically let that slip in there? There is no way on God's green earth that got in there by accident. And they can sit back and verbally loosen the restraints on what you can spend that money on and wait until enough of it has been spent and they can come in and say, we want that money today, the city or the county or the state can't pay it and that will force them to take over that entity. And I will welcome you to the USA, United Socialist America. Now. Could that actually happen in America? I don't know. Could you fraud an election in America? Could you actually go down the streets in a town in America and break out windows and loot and kill people with no accountability in America? We see it happening every day. The time for the conservative Christian to sit back and watch what happens is done. You sit back and wait to see what happens, it's going to be too late. Last year, when the CARES Act money came, it came to the state of Idaho with the instructions to Governor Little to divide it amongst the counties according to populace. For COVID related expenses. That was the order from FEMA. That was the federal orders on the CARES Act money. Brad Little sent it to the counties with the instructions, use it for property tax refund and broadband expansion. I didn't know broadband caused COVID. I didn't know it cured COVID. It's a stretch of the imagination to connect those two together. And so I, I went to the other two commissioners and our prosecutor in an executive session and said, guys, I don't think this is legal. I don't think the county can be in broadband business in competition with regular business. I think it's against the law. And the prosecutor says, well, that's because it is against the law. And I went, he's asking us 
to violate his own laws. So our treasurer comes forth and she brings forth four stat state statutes and reads them off why she cannot write a check to you refunding part of your property tax money from last year. There is no avenue in law that will allow her to do that. In fact, there are state statutes that prevent that from happening. If you overpaid last year and you prove you overpaid, that will be credited to your previous your next year. But she cannot give you a cash refund. State law prohibits that. So we've got an outside attorney firm that specializes in federal law and federal grant money and things like that. They're on the phone with us. We're explaining our dilemma. And he says, guys, at the end of the day, the commissioners have the authority to make that decision what to do with this money and follow these directions. As your attorney, I am obligated to inform you that if you three gentlemen use that money following Brad Little's instructions, you will in fact do a le lengthy term in a federal penitentiary. And here are the laws that says that's going to happen. And so I filed a lawsuit against Brad Little on behalf of the county. Our prosecutors sent the letter out to the other 43 counties and by the noon the next day, all 43 counties prosecutors had responded and said, you guys are spot on. You saved our butt. We'd all be in trouble. So our governor says one thing out the side of his mouth, but does something else out the other. Why would he intentionally or unintentionally give instructions to every commissioner in the state of Idaho to break federal and state law? Me personally, I'm not all that sensitive, but I took that a little personal. And so if you go on my website, you can read a letter that I sent to him just previous to that when he wanted to roll us back last year into stage two of the COVID emergency. Y'all remember that? We at Bonner County told him, said, you can roll it back to whatever stage you want to, but the people of Bonner County are free. They're American citizens. They don't have to wear a mask if they don't want to. And we're not going to, and we're not going to mandate it. So the letter I sent him on that is pretty, I'm pretty sure is the reason I didn't get an invite to the Christmas party. Uh, so our own state government has become what our federal government is now doing. It is going to great lengths to do that. When Brad Little left the state, Janice McGeechan did an executive order ending the mask mandate, which she had a right to do. He left the state, that made her governor. She knew he was gonna rescind that when he got back, and he did. But she made a statement in doing that. When he left the second time, she did something similar. And he came back, but this time when he came back, he got on TV and said, the lieutenant governor does not have that authority to do that. Now, on TV, your governor said those exact words. I want to read you a little something. Section 12, Idaho Code. Lieutenant governor to act as governor in case of the failure to qualify the impeachment or conviction of treason, felony, or other infamous crime of the governor, or his death, removal from office, resignation, absence from the state, inability to discharge the powers and duties of his office, powers and duties and emoluments of the office for the residue of the term, or until the disabilities shall cease, shall dissolve upon the lieutenant governor. Nowhere in there does it say she needs permission. By state law, it is an automatic transfer of power to the lieutenant governor to become governor for the period of time that he is unavailable. That is state law. 
So now our governor has either intentionally lied to mislead the public or he is ignorant of Idaho law or all the above. And he's more than welcome to pick A, B, or C. One thing I can promise you, he will not willfully show up at a forum with Steve Bradshaw for governor. And the reason is, he does not want to answer to any of the three things I just shared with you in public. Because those three questions will get asked. What were you thinking when you asked me to violate state and federal law? What were you thinking when you looked at this and passed it down to every county and city in the state? Where were you and our Attorney General when you sent this to us? That's why you won't see him meet with me anywhere because he knows that those questions are coming. As Idaho governor, I will protect the sovereignty of the great state of Idaho. I will make sure that the federal government stays in its lane. It will fund what it needs to fund, but it will stay in its lane. There will not be overreach of power over and above the sovereignty of the state of Idaho. I will take the, the uh, public lands back. There is an avenue to do that. 30 state, 36 states have done that in the history of this nation. The feds do not own a title or a deed to the national forest within the borders of the state of Idaho. That's information that they don't readily share with anybody. Why has Idaho not taken that land back? I'll tell you why the Idaho has not taken that land back. Because it takes a governor with a backbone that will tell the feds, no. You don't know how to manage it. The fires on the federal lands in the state of Idaho last year produced more carbon emissions into the air than all of the power plants in the continent of Europe last year for the total year because they do not manage anything. The federal lands managed by federal government in the state of Idaho produce less than one dollar per acre per year revenue. I'm sorry, I can beat that in the desert. That's pathetic. That is nothing but pathetic. Idaho lands, IDL, produced 38 times more revenue on IDL lands than the feds did on public lands in the state of Idaho last year at less than 5% of the same amount of acreage. They can't manage to do anything except not manage anything. If we take the public lands back and tell the federal government no, here's where the dilemma comes in. 42% of every dollar in the state of Idaho is federal money. 42 cents out of every dollar. If we take that away, we've got to replace it with something, right? Otherwise, you see a big downfall in the economy. Well, if IDL can produce 38 times more per acre on 5% as much land, a bulk of that just came back, didn't it? Through IDL managing the forest within the borders of the state of Idaho. Idaho has 29 different gyms on, in it. It has an uh, ample supply of gold. It has an ample supply of silver. It has all the other gyms. And it has three of the hottest rock spots on planet Earth. That's uranium. That's what hot rocks are classified as. All sitting on federally controlled land, not federally owned 
land, federally controlled land that is within the borders of the sovereign state of Idaho. Idaho has the ability to be one of the richest states in the nation. It has gas, it has oil. Why are we being under the thumb of the federal government? Because we don't have a governor in the last 40 years that had a backbone that's willing to stand up for the people of Idaho. It is in truth not for glory or riches or honors that we're fighting, but for freedom. For that alone, no honest man gives up but with life itself. That's the declaration of a growth in 1320 that y'all saw Braveheart? That's where that quote came from, the original. And it was sent to the Pope to share with the King of England that Ireland would not be under their control anymore. Idaho needs legislators and it needs governors with a backbone and a love and a passion for the people and the state of Idaho. I have not seen that in some time, but in very few of the elected officials on the state level. We've got a couple of people running for higher offices in the state of Idaho that need to be elected. The one running for Lieutenant Governor, Priscilla Giddings, is one of them. I've known Priscilla for quite some time. I count her as a friend. She's the Top Gun pilot. She's got 2,000 combat hours in Iraq and Afghanistan flying an ATN. If she was running for governor, I wouldn't need to because she's not afraid. She's got enough backbone. She's got more backbone in her than most men I've encountered in my life. Well, how can I say that? She's a girl. Well, I'll tell you what. You crawl in the cockpit of an ATN warthog and then you fly head on into artillery and heavy gunfire and tell me that you're not afraid. And then do that 2,000 hours worth. There's somebody with a backbone and is not afraid. And besides that, her dad saved my life, so I kind of like the family. <laughs> she needs to be in that position. I hate to see her go as a representative because we need good representatives, but she can do so much more in that spot. She just got promoted recently to lieutenant colonel from major, and that was after our legislators' ethics committee, they call themselves, had brought up, uh, trumped up charges on her because she re reposted a link. And that's it. She made no comment about it. She just reposted a link that Redoubt News had done. And that's it. And they brought her up on ethics charges. And I called Sage Dixon, who is a representative in Bonner County, and is head of the ethics committee. And I called him the Saturday morning before they were gonna have that committee on Monday. And I said, Sage, if you wanna commit political suicide in the state of Idaho, then I would go after an American hero, top gun pilot, highly decorated military officer on a BS charge. I think you've got a great shot at committing political suicide. His response was, when I have time, I'll explain to you the process. Waiting to hear it. 
can't wait to hear it. But anyway, so this is, this is what's happening in our legislature. If you're a conservative Christian fighting for the people of Idaho and you won't sell out, then they come after you however they can. And I more than welcome them to come after me. I don't care. They don't understand. Little David left the sheep to go fight a giant. Was he afraid? No. No, when he got there, his older brother looked at him and said, Why are you here? You came here because you wanted to watch the fight. And he looked his older brother right in his eye in front of everybody and said, Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause in the state of Idaho to take back this state? We have got to vote on what we believe and stand on and get people in there that is not afraid to stand up, speak out, and fight the status quo. I am not doing this for a career move at 66 years old. I don't need a career. I got two careers already. I don't need a third one. My wife asked me, said, what happened to just retire and fish and stuff? I said, we're working on it. But I can't find in the Bible where, where a pastor retires. They expire. So we just keep going forward. That's what our job is. I've got, a, I've got a war left in me, and I intend on fighting it for the state of Idaho. I fight for God and country. And I do it in the state of Idaho. And I'm going to do it for you. I watch the things on the county level coming from the state and coming from the feds and going, there's got to be a way to stop this. And I'll tell you what, why it happened and exactly how it happened. Because in 1963, President Johnson passed an executive order that pastors could no longer bring politics into the pulpit. Somebody should have told me. <laughs> when the pastors quit being the leaders of the community, who leads the sheep? They either go astray or they sit there and become stagnant. And I shared that with a group of pastors in Sandpoint, Idaho. I told them, you guys are going to have to man up and decide whether you are pastors or hirelings. Because there is a difference. A hireling took it as a job. A shepherd took it as a life order. He will lay his life down for it. He will defend them. He will kill the bear. He will kill the lion for the sheep. If you took a job as a pastor, as a career, you're in it for the wrong reason. But when the shepherds quit leading the sheep, that leaves the evil, a wide open door for evil to come in. And we are in an evil versus good battle for our life. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness in high places. It is a spiritual war that we're fighting. And a spiritual war that we can win because God did not make us losers. He never told us to quit and sit down and do nothing. It is our job and obligation to engage in the things in our community. We are part of that community. We are part of His family. And as His children, we have the right of passage straight to the throne room. But yet we act like we're ashamed to call out to Him and ask Him for anything. The conservative Christian needs to get back on their knees and figure out who they are, whose they are, and what they're going to do. As for me, I'm a child of the Most High God. I fear nothing because He's got my front and my back. He's got His angels charge over me. 
If he tells me to go and do this, I go and do that. Why? Because he said to. Aren't you afraid? No. Why? Because I trust him. I've got a death sentence three times from emergency room doctors. And each time I turned to God and said, is this it? And he said, no. And so I got up and walked out of there. The last time, eight doctors were looking at me. Five of them came into the ER room, and I knew it wasn't good when five of them walked in there. They didn't have party trays, so it wasn't a family reunion. And he said, we're really concerned about your health. And I'm going, yeah, me too now. <laughs> What's up? He said, well, you know you got that blood clot. I said, yeah. He said, well, it's three times the size it was yesterday. I go, okay. He says, you got less than 5% chance of leaving this hospital. I said, Doc, I know I'm leaving this hospital. I just don't know if I'm going out the front door or through the refrigerated section. What's my options? He told me the options. One, go home, take some pain pills, and maybe it'll dissolve. He said, I'm telling you, because it tripled in size, if you do that, you'll be dead in five days. I said, okay, option one is go on to the next one. Option two, we keep you here, put you on a high blood thinner, high powered blood thinner, and hope you don't bleed out. Go home and die, stay here and bleed out. We got a third choice, Doc. He said, no, that's pretty much it. I said, what kind of success rate are we talking here? He said, under normal conditions with a portal vein blockage, he said, 10 to 15%. He said, because of your condition, you got less than 5% chance. I said, 5% with the math that I know is much bigger than nothing. Let's go with the 5%. And two days later, he sent me out of there. That night, I sat in, a, in that laid in that uh, ICU unit, and went, "Lord, if this is how I'm going, I'm good with that. I've had a good ride, but if you've got something else for me to do, here am I." I had no idea that this was going to be my cup, and he said, "Run for governor." And I'm going. Okay, because I, I have a lot of courage. I've never been afraid of a lot. But to go there and say, God, and I understand what you said. I know that I know what you said. But laying in that hospital bed, you know, that was a foxhole prayer. We was under attack, you know. And I was just kind of desperate. I don't have that kind of courage because he might go, well, here's your blood clot back. So here am I taking on this challenge and I will do it with every ounce that he gives me to go forward with. And when it's time for me to go, I will go. But until then, I will fight the fight. I will run the race. I will not stray left or right and I will not bend. I will not bow. And I am not at the least worried about burning. I will do everything that I am able to do as your governor to protect the sovereignty of this state against federal overreach and state overreach that we've watched over and over again over the last three years. I was the only church in Bonner County that did not sh shut my doors. At the start of the pandemic, which is not a pandemic, by any stretch of the imagination. The fear-mongering of it is a pandemic, but the virus is not. The virus is real. The vaccine is not a vaccine. They had to change the terminology of vaccine in order to make it qualify. So, do we change the terminology of what a horse that's broke is? so that we can qualify the horse that's not broke? Does it change what it is just because we change the terminology? 
No. No, it does not. It is still what it is. And it's a farce. The virus is real. There is a so-called vaccine. And there are masks. But it's your choice to take the vaccination. It's your choice to wear the mask. Me personally, I don't believe anybody in Idaho is ugly enough to need a mask. I come close, but the rest of you are good. But it's your choice. There is no law or legal avenue that exists in the United States of America that allows any entity from the feds on down to the cities to pass a mandate that tells you you have to have a vaccine or you have to wear a mask. There is no avenue for that. But yet they do it anyway. What you need to understand about the governor, he is not a lawmaker. He does not have the authority to make law. That is an overreach of power. Legislation makes law. Senate passes the law. The governor signs it into action. The courts determine how the law will be applied. You have three separate branches for a reason so that you don't have a dictator or a tyrant. This is still the United States of America. And as long as that Constitution is intact and the Idaho Constitution is intact, I will not stand by and allow it to be abused, stepped over, or misused. It has raised a passion within, within me that has brought me into a fight that I will fight. As your governor, I will do what's right in the eyes of God. Not what's right in my eyes, not what's right in the eyes of somebody else's opinion, but what's right and just in the eyes of God. My opinion counts for naught. If it doesn't pass mustard with him, it's not going to pass mustard with you. Are we in agreement on that one? So you decide whether you want somebody that's going to wear a suit and tie every day and look pretty on TV, which would take a major act on my part, Personally, I think the whole concept of a slip knot around your neck put there by yourself is just wrong. <laughs> it just, but that's me. I just, maybe that's the cowboy in me. A, a slip knot around the neck just sound it sounds wrong, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it works for the chicken or the rabbit, you know what? You know, but no. We have got to get rid of career politicians that have become part of the status quo. They say one thing, but they do something else. They say what it takes to get elected, but then they do something else. And once in there, the pressure from above becomes so great that they finally bow and bend to it and buy into it for whatever reason. Maybe they're a little weak, maybe they're afraid, whatever. I am not for sale. I have already been bought with a price by the blood of Jesus Christ. He holds the title on me. I am not for sale. They can push against me all they want to. This old fart still got a lot of fight left in him. <laughs> and one uh, attorney said, I will be behind you all the way, but understand that they are going to come after you. I said, well, understand this. There is a risk involved in that. When I was a little boy, I watched a squirrel go up in a hollow in a tree down in Texas at Lake Sam Rayburn. And I told my dad, I said, I'm going to climb up there and get one of them babies, and I'm going to have a pet squirrel. And he said, I have no doubt you can climb that tree. And your little arm will fit right in that hole. But once you catch that squirrel, have you considered how you're going to turn loose of him? 
And I got to thinking about that and them little hands they got. And if they can crack a hickory nut, <laughs> what in the world can they do to my fingers? <laughs> and so I thought better of it. And I thought, you know what? Dad's pretty wise for an old guy. And so if you come after somebody, there's always that risk. You might catch him. So that's my attitude on it. You're looking at a guy that has never been afraid to try anything. Now, I'm not the guy that said, here, hold my beer and watch how stupid I can be. But I've come really close. <laughs> as far as I know, I'm the only guy in the United States that has ever bulldogged a white-tailed deer out the window of a Chevy flatbed one-ton truck at 35 miles an hour. Why in the world would anybody in their right mind, why would that even pass through from the left ear to the right? I was there. The deer was there. Why not? <laughs> Nobody ever told me I couldn't do that. Therefore, I never believed I couldn't do that. I highly recommend you don't do that. If you do, make sure that you are not enrolling distance of the fence. Because the next cross tie will break your hold just immediately. And you'll lay there wondering where your breath went, must have left with that deer. So it was not a wise decision, but I took on the challenge. And this one will be no different, except this one, I'll use divine discernment in his direction instead of my own bad ideal. And every morning that I get up, I'm stiff and hurting in places from things that were bad ideals that I thought of, but I've never hurt from the things that he thought up and sent me to do. No matter how hard they were, I did them. And I never believed that I couldn't do them. You can do whatever God calls you to do. Don't worry about what you have or what your ability is. Remember who you are, whose you are, and what He tells you to do, you can do or He wouldn't send you on that job. Everything you need will be provided as you go forward. That I have learned. And I trust in God. I trust what He tells me to do. And I've never had Him take me all the way to a point and go, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Now wasn't that fun? He always takes me to the goal. Always, without fail. He has never failed me. I've learned from experience and trusting God that He knows so much more than I do. And He has always placed everything logistically needed to do whatever He called me to do at my disposal when I needed it. There's been times when I'm kind of like, Any time now. But he knows when the right time is. So you just keep going. Don't get in front of him. Keep following. You cannot follow from in front. But if you follow God, he will take you to victory. And he will accomplish what he wants to get accomplished. And I do not believe that he wants Idaho under socialist rule and a tyrannical government. And if we do not get a governor that will stop what's coming to the state of Idaho on the federal level at the border, then we will be looking at it on our front porch and nobody will win at that point. We will all lose. We'd like to think that we're self-sufficient and we can defend our little house, but I'm gonna tell you what, when it gets to that point, there's not enough of you to defend your house. Because they're not going to send one guy. We've got to get a governor that will protect this state. 
with a vigor and a compassion and a passion, whatever it takes to protect this state, do it. And don't sell out, don't bend, do not bow. And that's what it's going to take to keep Idaho for our grandkids, the Idaho that we've enjoyed the last 30 years. Some of y'all, your whole life has been here. I've been here actually one year longer than I was in Texas, so now I'm a tater. Before I was just a cactus, I guess, even though there's not too many cactus in Houston area. But we've got to do something differently than we've been doing. And fighting is what it's going to take. Not with guns and knives, but with the vote and with the power to get the right people in those spots. And if we don't put the right people in those spots to protect this state, we will lose this state. You look at what's happened to California 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you'd have said that will never happen to any state in America. Now you look at it and you go, yeah, but that's not going to happen to any of the red states. But you start looking at some of the red states and how they're turning purple. We've got a governor that said he's red, but he's bluer than the sky in Montana. When I turn blue on you, it'll be because the paramedic could not get his job done. <laughs> I want to be your governor. I want to fight that fight and protect the state of Idaho and keep it the great state of Idaho. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Well, it's turned up pretty good. <laughs> uh, actually, we have a traveling mic here, so uh, you ready to take some questions? I will take questions. Okay, let's uh, start. Right, an right answers are free. Wrong answers are even more free. Truthful answers, Truthful answers are required. Are Hey, uh, Steve, I, I don't mean to put, be put you on the spot, but I know this has gone through your mind. We've got a number of uh, individuals running for governor that claim to be running on a conservative ticket. As some of the talks that's out there, and I'm sure you've heard it, Steve, is the votes get divided so much that Brad Little gets in by default. And, and I, I think one of the things that has to be done sooner than later is and I, I think you've done a great job on on talking exactly hitting the mark but we also have to start separating what makes each candidate different and we've got the, we've got the lieutenant governor that's running too yeah. so I, I think Steve what would help at least for the people that are here what's different about what you are versus what the other people are running on conservative tickets for the governor's office and then how do you answer that question about dividing votes to get somebody because brad little i think everybody everybody i know in this room in this valley i think are fed up with brad little there's no yeah. doubt uh brad little got in last time because we're all labrador come in at the last minute and it split the vote three ways he ended up with the larger third uh and so there's that risk uh Ed Humphreys, I think uh, Ammon Bundy even expressed, I believe, that if it comes down to the time and the polls do not have them where they need to be, they will withdraw. And to keep from splitting that vote. Uh, Janice has expressed that that's not gonna happen she is convinced that she is inevitable to be the governor of Idaho. We've got to get past that mentality. And I want you to understand something. You will never hear me say anything bad about Janice McGeechan. She is a sister in Christ. I've known her for a while. I love her. Uh, there is nothing that I've ever heard said that she's done wrong on anything. I've never heard that she's ever done anything wrong. I cannot find fault in Janice McGeechan. The biggest difference between me and her, she's much more attractive. 
Uh, for what I see coming, I don't believe she is the person we need in that driver's seat because of the pressure and the fight that's coming. I believe that she will not be strong enough. I'd like to believe that she is. But everything within me says that she is not. And she has no business taking on the battle and the war that's fixing to come. But if it was her or Brad Little or one of the other ones, I would vote for her. I honestly would. But I'm going to vote for me. Okay. Mine's quick. How do I get a copy of that document, the 603, whatever that was called? I would love to have a copy of that. That's all I have. Every city council, every mayor, every county commissioner has a copy of that. The attorney general has a copy of that. How is it that some hillbilly cowboy in North Idaho spots that and our attorney general doesn't? I am not a lawyer and I found it. How can they read it and not find it? If he read it, how is it he did not notice it? How is it the governor got it and didn't say anything? They're bought and paid for. Well, there's that. Yeah. There you go with them details. That would be my assumption. I don't have proof of that, but it certainly has a really stinky appearance. I, <clears throat> I'm not from Idaho. My daughter and son-in-law live here, and we've come out to visit, but we Welcome are home. very patriotic people. We did live in Nevada <clears throat> and pastored a church down there for about 16 years and then ended back at East. But um, we have uh, been introduced to a organization, the Constitutional Sheriffs and Police Officers Association. Are you familiar with that? I am. Uh, I think that is... Uh, something that really needs to be promoted in every state that has sheriffs in every county uh, so i would encourage you <clears throat> uh, if you were governor to promote that for all the counties to because the sheriff local sheriff has more authority than yes he does we, we are blessed in bonner county with a excellent constitutional sheriff uh, when they pass those mandates uh, he said, well, I don't know how you're going to enforce it because I'm not going to cite for it. And if I don't cite for it, the prosecutor sure ain't hearing it. So, you're right. That is a good association and I'm familiar with them. You mentioned put good people in good places. Well, um, the State Board of Education, you know, seven-eighths of the board is appointed, I believe, by the governor. And how is it that we end up with a liberal presidents of Idaho universities and the board mandating or attempting now to, uh, you know, promulgate diversity, equity, and inclusion in the left wing definition of it? Because there are words that could be used for conservatives. But how is it that our Republican governors? have us ending up with a, a liberal state board and what because you do about it. Your conservative governor is not a conservative. If you comb his hair, you'll find that it will come to a point. <laughs> yeah. right. he, he is a wolf in sheep's clothing. But you'll be careful if you were governor to... Oh, have they a surprise coming? Okay. The majority of them will be unemployed and somebody else will be sitting in their chair. Don't even, don't even get me started on public school. Hi, right, so what is it when you say that, was, that does set you apart from all these other guys? I have, I'm not, I want to try to say this where I'm not patting myself on the back because I, I want to stay humble through this. But I have a, pa a passion and a tenacity to take on any fight and any challenge that comes. 
and I've never backed down from anything. And up until the last year and a half, two years, I've reflected back on the years that I've got to here, and I see the hand of providence on my life through things that happened that got me to where I'm at. I've never been afraid to take on any challenge. I actually got in fight with a gang in Houston. I wasn't by myself when it started, but I was by myself immediately after it started. I don't know what happened to the two that were with me. They got rabbit in their blood. They were transcended into another place somewhere. I don't know what happened to them. They disappeared like Casper the ghost. And I came out of that house without a scratch, a bruise, so much as a black eye or a fat lip. And I look back at that and I go, You know, I didn't have any special ops training when that fight started. And there was 13 plus people in there that were not on my side. There was one that was. But I look back and I realize there was more than just me in there. And it's not humanly possible that I could have been in that fight and not got touched. But it was God's hand on my life. And, and I can name numerous things where he's brought me through to get me to where I'm at. And now I see the purpose of Steve Bradshaw. Where before I never really had one. I just did what was necessary. But now I see the purpose and the reason. I, um, right now we're still under an emergency declaration. That'll end day one. Okay, so uh, my question about that was, if you were to become governor, uh, would you commit to limiting that to two weeks that would then be extended by the legislature if it was deemed necessary? That was actually forwarded by the legislature, and he vetoed it. Well, my question is not what he would do, it's what you would do. I will end the emergency as soon as they swear me in, That'll, that document will be laying there, and I will sign it on the spot, ending the emergency, which will end the federal money flow of the CARES Act and ARPA. That will end as soon as I sign that. Uh, and I appreciate that. I mean, and I, I will sign future. anything that legislation brings forward that puts a li time limit on an emergency declared by a governor. Okay. Thank you. To not do so would be endorsing tyranny. Thank you for coming, Steve. Um, I'm just kind of curious. Um, do you have any financial background as far as uh, uh, accounting or anything that would be that would help you in the place of governor as far as allocating the money? Um, I know that. The governor is ultimately responsible for a large budget a large the budget and allocation of all that stuff and just if you have any background in that I'd like to hear uh, that. that same question came to me was fired at me when I ran for commissioner the first time and they asked what qualifies you to handle a budget of 52 million dollars and I said well I've been self-employed my entire life I've had my own company my entire life. Math is not complicated when it comes to budgets. You don't even use the alphabet. <laughs> Numbers do not change and math doesn't change because the number gets longer. It's just a bigger number. But the math is still the same. So you have to look at each and every department. You have to go through there. And of course, as a governor, you got people helping you do that. But you look at it and put an eye on everything that's being spent. And then don't be afraid to ask a question. Why is your budget spending this much? Show me why you are spending this much in your department. 
We've done that in Bonner County and kept the taxes flat three years straight because we cut fat, we cut foolish spending. Before, they didn't have a purchasing department. Uh, if Treasury needed printer paper, they just went to Staples and bought two or three packages. Instead of a purchasing agent buying a pallet of it at a fraction of the cost, and you go into the purchasing department and get what you need. We did that, it cut our office supplies expenses by two thirds, just by cutting the local out of it. I mean, it's nice to do local business, but buy in bulk and control it. We cut fat, we made each department run more efficient, was able to bring their wages up to market because we had such an overflow. And you see that in counties and states and cities because they don't, typically don't pay that much. And so you get somebody in there, you train them, like road and bridge, you train somebody to use a backhoe, you train them on the excavator, you get them running a road grader, they get good at it, they leave the county for $15 an hour and go to work for somebody else at $30 an hour. Would you change jobs for double the pay? Absolutely you would. So now we're training somebody else. So now the person that's training him, you're only getting half a guy out of him because he's spending the other part of his time training the new guy so that he can go on and get into the private sector. So we got everybody's wages up to market with private business pretty close as we could our deputies were way underpaid for years. I watched for 30 years as deputies and road grader operators came to Bonner County, got trained, and then left and made good money. And I, I couldn't help but think, that's just foolish. That's, not, that's just foolish. Why don't you pay them what they're worth and keep them? It makes sense. And so we got our sheriff's department wages up comparable with Spokane and Coeur d'Alene and Kootenai County. And now we don't have that turnaround. We don't have that revolving door. The ones that we have are staying. Would they leave and go to Spokane for 10 bucks an hour? You bet. Would they for a dollar and a half? No. No, they're not gonna leave Bonner County and go to the big city to the septic tank for a buck an hour. And so now we've got them where they're in competitive market and we're keeping the employees. They're happy. When you're happy on your job, you actually do your job better. You look forward to doing your job. And you have people helping you. And so through management, before they didn't have management meetings. Every month we have a department head meeting with all the department heads. And before that never happened. They just, well, how's things going? I don't know. Yeah, I didn't talk to them. Have you talked to them? It was just, I don't know how they done it. I thought, you know, I've never been involved in this in the county level, but it's like, no wonder government's so screwed up. They run it like the big government. They can't manage anything. And, well, let's, pa let's pass a policy. Well, okay. What's the policy say? And what's the repercussions of that policy? What's going to happen when you put that policy in place? Is it a good policy? Is it beneficial? Is there a plus side to it? What is the minus? For every plus, there is a minus. So you have to look at both sides of everything that you do. I think this department is wasting money. So we're going to cut their budget in, on these items, these items, and these items. Okay. Now we've made the budget look better. But what's gonna be the effects of that? So it's more than a moment to moment thing. You've gotta think these things out and look at them and study them and make wise decisions based on what the probability offsets are. We went uh, self-insured in the county before we were paying almost two million a year in liability insurance. And if you got fired from the county for stealing a police car, 
you'd find some ambulance chasing lawyer he'd file suit for wrongful termination with the county and the insurance company will go well if we go to trial it's going to cost us this much so here's thirty five thousand dollars go away and sign this release it was an atm for anybody that lost their job for doing bad service we went self-insured our liability insurance went from over two million a year to five hundred thousand because they only cover once it reaches a certain point up to that point we pay out of the tort claim budget once the lawyers in town found out we don't have an insurance company and we are going to fight you and go to court now is let's say you're an attorney and you're going to defend the lady next to you on a on a deal that you know is BS she got caught stealing cash out of the Treasury Department you know she got fired for the right reason it was a blessing she didn't go to jail but now she wants to sue for wrongful termination and you think it's a paycheck because the insurance company a roll but now you put all this time in as an attorney and you're building this big legal bill to find out we're self-insured we're gonna see you at the courthouse now you have to reconsider I'm probably gonna lose this because she got fired for a good reason and I am NOT gonna get paid because she doesn't have any money she doesn't even have a job and she's not gonna get hired because she stole money nobody in their right mind is gonna hire her. so now as a local attorney you're gonna go you know what they just closed the ATM machine and our liability over the last three years has went like this what we were paying in legal claims and insurance before went from over 200 million to right at a half a million to 750,000 for claims and the liability insurance above the cap that's how you run a good budget you know, I arrived late, so I apologize if I've already answered this, but you mentioned having a purpose, so can you succinctly tell me, in this endeavor, what's your purpose? My purpose is to protect the sovereignty of the state of Idaho, take back the public lands. Idaho has the ability to be self-sufficient, energy-wise and dollar-wise. We don't need that 42 cents of federal money for every dollar that we have. We have the ability within the borders of the state of Idaho to be one of the richest states in the nation. But we need a governor that will tell the federal government, go home, we'll let you know if we need you. If, we need, if we've got an interstate highway that needs fixing, that's your responsibility to do that. You will fund what you need to fund, but you will stay in your lane and you will leave the rest of Idaho alone. Uh, on that, I have a question that keeps coming up here. Um, you know, public lands and the the getting them back from the federal government and the state taking over for them. Some of the big worry I hear from a lot of people are that um, a lot of us, actually, I think most of us enjoy public lands. And the big fear that's going to happen is the state's going to say, hey, I have this cash pot of land that I'm going to sell now. And it ends up that it gets sold to... It will be the, put in, in a it, trust to IDL and will not be sold. Well, and that, uh, the thing is, though, is it goes beyond that, you know, is <clears throat> do we have access to it? How do I guarantee Absolutely. that we have access to it? Because, uh, you know, it's easy to say we have you know we have all of this these minerals and is a company really going to say okay i'm going to come in and spend x team million dollars to go do this but i'm not going to own the land and also i don't want to let anybody in anywhere near where i'm doing anything and all that so all of a sudden you end up restricting access and part of the part of the economy of idaho is actually based on the use of the public lands it's right. hunting fishing rv all of this that Ranching. we all enjoy and so the question really is is 
How do you guarantee that we don't lose access to public lands? Because we have already lost access to public lands by them being uh, encircled by private land and then access cut off. Right. And, and that happened back in, I think, 67 or 68. And a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, if five, you had... Five years ago. If you had public land, but you personally owned a piece of private land, before people would cross that to get to public land, and Congress decided that, no, that is your property. As your property rights, you have sovereignty over your private piece of property. And so you do not have to grant access to that. And we lost access to some of the hunting places. I saw that in Colorado. And uh, a lot of places, the ranchers had land, and they provided an access trail to that and there were signs there in the mountains out of Pagosa Springs, Colorado that says no loaded firearms for the next three quarter mile or quarter mile, however far you're going across this person's private property. And so you were granted access across there, but because some people can't follow the rules and the abuse that they would do, the ranchers cut, cut it off. They put the fence up and shut it down. And so to guarantee that, if we were to take the public lands back, those roads that access our public lands would remain intact and they would always be public lands under management of IDL. The forestry, everything else, the ranchers that are leasing federal land, that's not federal land, it's just controlled by the feds, would still have that same option to graze cattle on it when it belonged to IDL. None of that would change. And so you need a governor that will follow that through because I hunt and fish and I don't snowmobile and I certainly don't get on skis. I've met enough orthopedic surgeons already. But uh, you have, and those are all valid things, all valid concerns. So you've got to look at all of that and make sure that that is all in place once you go forward with it. And you have to be able to, to make that rock solid in perpetuity so that the next administration doesn't come in and say, well, we're going to sell this part. It cannot be so. IDL land cannot be sold. Now, they've done trades with some of the timber companies, and, but access was still there. And so you've got to keep all that intact, but give the sovereignty of Idaho to Idaho. My question is that we have a, obviously have a lot of legislators in uh, office right now that, that are leaning left. And- No, they're falling. <laughs> and putting forth a lot of social agenda issues uh, coming through. And I, I just want to know uh, what you can do as governor uh, by use of your veto power, because uh, quite honestly, uh, we, we live in a state that's very complacent. Right, um, and, and we need to get out of that. Even locally, we had a 10% uh, rate of uh, voting coming out, which is absurd. It is. This, in this day and age. And so my question is, uh, how, do, how do we overcome that? Because I really doubt we're going to see a lot of these people voted out unless, we, unless people wake it's up gonna and take, start voting. It's going to take people on the ground going door to door saying this person right here right. represents this. So if you the one elected, you have is doing this. So if you get elected and you face a Senate and a legislature that are leaning left, how, how are you going to I have no back? problem stamping veto on it or just letting it die on the desk. 
I don't have a problem with that at all. I've been pastoring for 19 years, and, and I really don't care if I offend you. I am not your mama, and I'll tell legislation the same thing. I'm not here to powder your behind and pat you on the back and go, poor baby. You write a bad bill, I'm going to stamp it accordingly. That sounds really good, Steve. <laughs> I have a question that might help us all determine how you differ from the other candidates that, are, that say they're Republican. Um, and it has four parts, and the, and the question starts with how do you feel about, and I think I know the answer, but I want this on record. How do you feel about the Idaho income tax? How do you feel about an executive order to ban abortion? How do you feel about term limits? And how do you feel about state nullification of unconditional federal laws? The abortion, I'm a pastor, so you know where I stand on that. If, if it is legal to do an executive order to ban abortion in Idaho while I'm in office, I will do that. But an executive order, as soon as I leave office, the next guy can reverse it. So legislation, even though I do an executive order, they will have to get on board and then pass a legislation that I can sign and it becomes law and it becomes much more difficult to reverse from there because then it's got to go back and get repealed. I like it. <laughs> you want to know the others? Income tax in Idaho. Income tax in Idaho is pretty minute for the average working guy. I mean, it's not really brutal like some other states. And, uh, and I've seen that in the construction business in the last 35 years. I've been here 34 years that uh, even though we had a 6% income tax, give or take, uh, most of what I paid in during the year, I got back at the end of the year. So for the working guy, it wasn't that big a deal. Working for the county, I'm making 89000 a year. So I'm not getting back what I'm paying in, but I don't mind. I pay my part. And... Uh, Let's talk about income tax just a minute. Our recent governor, because he found out that he couldn't legally give you money back on your property taxes, he gave you a refund on your income tax. How many, him, how many of you got your check? Amazing. I got one. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't big, but it's at least $50, you know, if you filed and paid income tax in Idaho. Let's go back to the CARES Act money a year, year and a half ago. $1.4 billion came to the state of Idaho with the instructions to divide it amongst the 44 counties of Idaho according to populace. Brad Little took $239 million, divided it amongst 44 counties according to populace. That's when I was looking at it going, I don't think we can do this. These instructions are not legal. And so we had an executive session. We had the federal attorneys online talking in, and our prosecutor, our assistant prosecutor, our treasurer, our county clerk, and the three commissioners. And I'm listening, and we're, we're going over it. And I said, hey, guys, just for a moment. I'm the only one in this whole conversation that does not have a college degree. But I did pass third grade math. There is one billion, one hundred million missing. Somebody want to tell me where that went? And one of the other commissioners said, what, do you think somebody took it? I said. I don't know. I'm asking the question. Do you know where it went? Well, no. I said, this I will guarantee you. There's at least one person somewhere that knows where it went. That has remained unanswered until about three months ago. We started getting our checks back on our income tax. Now, according to the rate that they paid it back, State of Idaho paid out somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 
to $250 million back to the citizens. That's all great and fun. Where did it come from? And then all of a sudden they find $900 million extra in reserve. Now I don't know what kind of bookkeeper you have, but if my bookkeeper didn't know that I had an extra $900 million, I'd be concerned how much longer I needed to keep that bookkeeper. But if you take that $900 million and that $250 million, give or take, that comes out to about $1 billion, $100 million. Now, is that the same $1 billion, $100 million that was missing a year and a half ago? I don't know. But I do know one thing. It came from somewhere, and the other went somewhere. These kind of things pique my interest. Steve, even, even if it was legal, which I know it's not, the concern I have, it's another chip with our Idaho sovereignty. Yeah. It makes us hostage to the federal government. So I would, Absolutely. even if it was legal, Steve, I still have an issue with it. I do too. Because it ties us to what the federal government wants to push down our throat. Yeah, and the bottom line is, the government hasn't given us anything. It's our money. Where did he get it? Yeah. From us. They don't make money. They take money, and then they spend it here and there. They don't have money, they take our money. Anything they pay out, came from us or is going to come from us. Now that's just basic math. Because they don't have a money machine that grows a tree that it now well, yeah. recently they're just printing it like crazy. But who's going to pay it back? Us. Our grandkids. Yeah. Our grandkids, our great grandkids. Now, I'm sure that there's nobody in Idaho on a political realm that would use money to the citizens to influence a vote for them. Well, I'm not totally sure of that. But I'm going to give them the benefit of a doubt. But it sure looks suspicious, doesn't it? Yeah. Thank you for that answer. So number three and four were term limits and then uh, uh, nullification, state nullification of overreaching federal you know, things that are outside the limits of the federal government in the Constitution. That's where the governor comes in. Yeah. You have to have a governor that looks at it and, and quit rubber stamping it going, oh yeah, they take care of me if I do that. You do that. Yeah. So, it takes a governor to go, <laughs> no, thanks though. And uh, what do you do if the gov if the, if you said... You know, we'll let the federal government take care of things like interstate highways. Well, what do, what do you do if they don't do that? Because I can see that happening. Quit collecting federal taxes for them. Oh, okay. I like that. If I shut your pocketbook off, your ears are forward, aren't they? You're paying attention now. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can sue me and get it back eventually maybe but it takes a governor with a backbone and the wisdom to go god what a novel ideal <laughs> no <laughs> come back next week with a different plan because that one's not going to happen in idaho and that's what it boils down to you've got to have a governor and a leader that knows how to be a leader has the tenacity to take on any fight that comes and stand his ground and quit buckling and bending over to pressure. I don't know who come up with the term peer pressure, but in the Navy, peer pressure is when the tide is put, pushing a ship up against a dock. That's peer pressure. Yeah. Did he answer all your questions? Term limits. Term limits. Term limits. I think term limits is a good ideal. The downside of that is if you get somebody that's really good that won't roll over, now you can't keep him or her. So there's, you know, there's an offset to that too.
but you look at the way things are on the federal level and some of the state, yeah, we need term limits. You know, even if it's like three terms or whatever, you take a vacation for four years, come back, try again. But term limits would help get rid of some of the septic problem. You know, if you flush the system, the crap goes away. Probably not the most gentle words, but it is what it is. Okay, thank you. I have a question for you, and it's in regards to the many, uh, many of the um, immigrants that are coming into our country illegally that are being fed into our state uh, by various organizations, and also our own federal government is flying them into our state. Uh, I encountered people in Twin Valley and they actually told me that there were actually Afghani immigrants in the college and that these immigrants actually work at the Chobani factory that is just filing for IPO by the way. And why are they not, why do we not require that our companies that are in our state take care of our citizens first? That's one question. Charity and, begins at home. And also, we have an abundance of government offices. It seems like IRS is expanding now here. We already have an FBI department in Pocatello and Idaho Falls. You know, we're a relatively quiet state. Why are they here? And what can our government, our, our elected government, do in order to make some changes so that we're not invaded with everything under the sun. You want, if we're talking about sovereignty, I want to understand a little bit more about how you would control that. Okay, the immigration deal. As a Christian, the Bible teaches us to help the stranger. But it also teaches us that the sword of justice is not swung in vain, which means we are to uphold the laws of the land. There is a legal process to come into the United States of America. If you do not follow that process, it's called illegal. Illegal is not a sick bird. It is a violation of law. So illegal is illegal. It's a violation of law, period. If you do not keep a rule of law, you will see what is happening now. There is 57 nationalities that have been arrested at the Mexican border. There's not 57 nations in Mexico, okay? I grew up in Texas. I know how many states there are in Mexico. There's not 57 of them. And none of them speak Egyptian, Hebrew, uh, Arabic. That is not a normal language in Mexico. So... They can't come through New York or San Diego or Portland or Seattle or Houston so they come to Mexico, get in with the horde and come in through that way. Illegal is illegal. You are either a citizen or you have a work permit and a permission to be here in this country and an avenue to become a citizen or you have crossed the border illegally that is my stand on that and if you are an illegal alien in the state of Idaho you will be arrested and shipped out what INS does with you after you cross the state line I don't care but if you are in the state of Idaho you will not take a job as an illegal alien that a citizen in the state of Idaho could be taken That's probably not going to be popular. And they'll say, oh, he's, he's a racist or whatever. He's mean. He has no compassion. He's certainly not a pastor. No, a pastor has many facets. And sometimes it requires to be hard. And it requires that we follow the rule of law where we live. And if it requires following the rule of law, then that's we, what we are to do. I understand why they want to come, 
They want to get away from the tyrannical governments and the places they're leaving, most of them. There are the other elements also. But there is a legal process to do that. Until they come up with a better and faster legal process, that's the one we're stuck with. And so we must follow it and adhere to it. And if you start laxing on it, then you start laxing more and more and more and you become complacent and there's no more rule of law and that brings you to 2021 United States of America. So you need a governor that will hold to the rule of law that is applicable to everyone. No one is above the law. From the governor on down to the illegal immigrant. The rule of law applies the same to every one of them. Very good. You know, it's nine o'clock. Well, I don't have to be nowhere till five o'clock tomorrow. Till five o'clock. And then I see some people wondering, you know, trying to, uh, a few more questions? I'll stay as long as you want. understand okay the question here is uh, and I think it goes off with the lady back here said is how 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 is the company hiring if they're illegal and stuff and all that how are they being hired in the first place right had a small business and we had everybody had to be documented we hired people you know that uh, were immigrants but they had we had to have documents that's how it's happening right there how is it how are they how are coming they from hired? one pocket over to another pocket that's how it's happening and you're talking about the yogurt place yes okay for every let's say they have a green card okay Let's say they're legally here. We'll give them the benefit of a doubt. For every employee that a company hires right now, the federal government will pay a certain percentage of that person's salary for a said period of time. So even though I take uh, Luigi Hinojosa that snuck over the river through Texas and came up to Idaho and went to work at the place. And let's say somehow he got a green card. And he hires him to work in his factory. Well, he's hiring him at $15 an hour. But the government's paying $7.50 an hour of that. So he's actually only paying seven fifty dollars an hour for the $15 an hour guy for X period of time. Once that period of time expires, you following me? Now, he either has to pay him and the others $15 an hour, or he has to shut down on Friday and lay everybody off. And that's legal. He can shut down because he needs to do some restructuring financially and lay everybody off, including the ones that he's going to keep. Monday, he starts calling back the ones he's going to keep and brings in a new group that he only has to pay half the wages of. And he's on his own. The same thing is happening in your hospitals over COVID. Now, these are facts I'm going to share with you. They took my... Uh, church off of YouTube for one week until they got a certain call and said, well, we have the evidence. Prove us wrong. We have a doctor from a major hospital that brought some facts to the church, and I repeated them. Fact is, COVID, children under five, total number of deaths from COVID to date is one which is horrible to lose a baby or, or a young child but we lose people every day for all types of reasons it's just life it's a sad and hurtful part of life but it's part of life one has died from COVID 27 
in the Northwest have died from the vaccine. So which is more dangerous for five-year-olds and under? That's a fact. That is a cold, hard fact. Hospitals are designed on a monetary basis at 85%, 80 to 85% capacity. You got 100 rooms to stay above the red line, pay your staff and make money, you've got to have 80 of those rooms full. Which nowadays is not that hard, the way people drive, the way they take care of themselves, the different recreational sports, cowboys, you know. We all go through the ER sooner or later if you're a cowboy. But so they operate on an 80% basic margin just to stay above the red. Optimal is 90 to 95% full. Now, over the last year and a half, we've heard, well, the hospitals are overwhelmed. There's no more room. Their, their staff is worked and overloaded. And we've all heard that, haven't we? And it sounds horrendous. Brad Little came on TV and said, there's no ICU, ICU units available in the state of Idaho. That was a bold-faced lie. The day he said it, Bonner General Hospital has four ICU rooms. Two were full. One of them went home that day. That's three in one spot. For the hospital to operate, they have to be at 80%. If they got 100 beds, they got to have 80 people in there. Okay? Now, federal law requires for those 100 beds, each one of those beds that are full, you have to have X number of staff. That's the law. So now, you've done this vaccine mandate, and a lot of your help has left. So now, you've got 65% capacity, because that's all the staff you have. You got 35 rooms that the door's shut on. You're not full. You're nowhere close to full. How are you staying above ground? Financially, how are you sustaining that? No company can, can sustain that. And now you're going to lay off the other 45% of your employees because they won't take the jab, which will reduce your beds down to 10? You cannot financially sustain that unless somebody is paying you. Dr. Fletcher, Bonner County, Idaho, interventional radiologist for years, one of the most renowned interventional radiologists in the, in the United States, daughter had a procedure done two years ago that he has done for years. He understands the code on the billing. He knows what it is. He's helping her on her bills. He's going over the bill, explaining what it is. Comes to code and he thought, I have no idea what that is. It is a 20% surcharge for COVID. Now she didn't have COVID, but they tested her for COVID. If you go to the hospital for any procedure right now, they will test you for COVID. Soon as they put that on the bill, COVID, even though there's no charge for the test, soon as they write COVID on that chart, there is an automatic 20% surcharge added on top of that bill. Now, if you're in there because you slipped on the ice and broke your arm, COVID had nothing to do with your arm being broke. It had nothing to do with your arm getting healed. But there's a 20% surcharge on there. For every bed that they do not fill, the government pays them that room rent for every bed. So now, let's say you're the CEO of the hospital. For you, it's about making a profit. 
It's about having a business that shows a profit. That is the purpose of doing that. The doctors and the nurses, their passion is helping you get well. That's what they want to do. The billing process comes through the CEO and the bookkeeping. That's where the money's made or lost. Now, they've got 100 beds, but they're only filling 20. Their liability insurance is based on capacity, the number of beds full, and the number of staff employed. They just took an 80% cut in liability insurance, which is probably several million dollars. Plus, the government is paying the rent on that room to keep it empty. You're being incentivized as the CEO to keep those rooms empty and not replace the staff. Why? Now do I not only have to pay them, I don't have to pay benefits on them. I'm saving hundreds of millions of dollars a year and the government's paying me to do it. State or federal? Federal. Anything they tag that comes through that hospital and they put the word COVID on there, positive or negative, they get 20% surcharge. If you are positive, now there's an upcharge because we have to treat a positive COVID patient. There's another bonus package for you. If you die from that broken arm and COVID is on the bill, it's COVID related death. Now COVID didn't kill you because you didn't have it. The anesthesia for the surgery killed you. But COVID was on the bill, therefore you can tag it a COVID death and you get a bonus as the hospital billing department. What is wrong with this picture? These are facts. And if you positively die of COVID, it's like winning the lotto for them. And some of the coroners are getting a bonus for tagging it COVID. But I'm going to share a fact with you right now. This is a medical scientific fact. No one in the United States of America has died from COVID. They have died with COVID. They died from pneumonia or complications caused by COVID. The virus does not kill. The effects of it start something else that takes the toll. That's just a medical scientific fact. But that's not the one they're telling you because if they told you the truth, then you wouldn't be afraid. And if I can make you afraid, now your rational thinking process has ceased to function. Oh no, we've got to wear our mask. You've got to stay six feet away from me. Oh my goodness. Oh, we're all going to die. Let me, hey, flash. We're all going to die anyway. We were born terminal. That's just a fact of life. But if I can make you scared, then I can manipulate you and move you to where I want you to be so that I have control over you. Tough times create tough men. Tough men create good times. Good times create soft people. Soft people create bad times. So if our men don't keep a backbone and stay hard, it's going to circle back. And that's what has happened. We have got to get in the fight. We have got to get people to vote. We've got to get the right candidates in office and put a stop to this foolishness. Okay, I guess I'm next with a question. Um, recently, Ron DeSantis announced that in the state of Florida, he was going to start up a state militia. And I think that is like an absolutely... Yeah. That is in the state thing. constitution that and, Idaho have a militia. Well, I, so I was just wondering about Idaho and like if you... State law. Like it is in the law books in the state of Idaho, in the Idaho constitution, if you are a male 
17 years old to uh, forget what the top age is 45. you are 45 you are automatically in the militia in the state of idaho no and you are under the call of the governor do we have one no why because it makes bad publicity they'll stereotype idaho they have a militia go back to american history you're required to have a militia. It would be better to have a state organized and controlled militia than to have these different groups that don't know each other and something happens. Let's say Antifa shows up in Idaho Falls and starts doing what they do. And you got a militia group over in Magic Valley, and you got one over in Pocatello, and they're going to come to your rescue. But they don't know each other. They have no communication with each other. They don't know that that one's not the bad guy, and they end up shooting each other. That's why you need an organized militia ready to take care of things like that. We have a state national guard. They could form the militia. They'd be under, the, under a general that's over the National Guard under the authority of the governor. Antifa came to Bonner County and Kootenai County and immediately left. And our sheriff gets updates from the FBI. That's what they do on terrorist type stuff. They share that information. And the FBI told our sheriff, you do not have to worry about Antifa coming back to Bonner County. Because they listen in on all the known leaders in those people. They listen in on their phones, off the record. And they said, they have heard all of them tell each other, stay the heck out of Idaho because they will kill you. And so, you know, if it works, it works. We have a retired uh, colonel up there. We had three different groups. We had one in, in Bonner County and Boundary County. There was one over in uh, Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, Post Falls area, and then another one. And he said, hey guys, let's all come together here. You need to know each other. You need to get a communication system set up and you need to be under the authority of the local sheriff. You don't do nothing until the sheriff calls you. And, it, and it's worked. It is a workable thing. It's part of the making of this country. Question in the back. Question in the back. I've never talked into one of these things. I'm, I'm just kidding. I just wanted to try. Fear not. <laughs> yeah. Um, we all know how close our borders are to California, Oregon, and Washington, and we've seen all the looting and the rioting and the stealing, breaking into stores and whatnot that's going on to those states. If that were to cross over to the line here and you were governor, would you form an Idaho militia? Would you would you take them out? Would you arrest them? How would you handle it? What would you do with that to stop it? I was hoping that question would come up at some point, but I was fearing that it would because I know what the media is going to do with it, but I'm going to answer it anyway. As governor of the state of Idaho, we have a rule of law that we will follow. You have a right as a citizen in the nation of the United States of America and in the state of Idaho to peacefully protest. But as soon as you pick up a brick and break the first window, you will be considered a domestic terrorist and the local law enforcement, state police, or National Guard has the authority under the hand of the governor to shoot you on sight as soon as you start to loot. And I'll promise you, it will only happen one time and they will go somewhere else um so i'm just wondering about you if if this is an all or nothing kind of deal with you 
if uh, if you talked earlier about the other candidates and talked about if it looked like they didn't have a chance, they would step down and allow whoever had the best shot. Uh, Brad Little not accept at least with them and Bundy because he came out and said he would do it for Brad. But uh, so my question is, uh, should you not have the opportunity to become the next governor? Does that mean you go back to Northern Idaho and retire? No, I but still got if, another two years if I don't make this. Okay, right. Well, my my question is, uh, so far I've liked most of the people that I've heard, um, and I think you guys that make a bloody good team. So if you, if say you didn't win, and say Janice did or Ammon did, and they gave you the call to come and serve. The state in some other capacity would that be something you were up uh, open to i would look at that okay thank you I just want to know if yeah you just want yeah. to be the man no look, so the lord has already started. made it plain to me there's no retirement in my future okay. retirement for me is a trip to les schwab okay. <laughs> thank you. anyone questions I would probably vote for Dorothy Moon for Secretary of State. Uh, I would have voted for Colton Bowl for AG. Uh, Raul has recently said that he will run for AG, and I think that he will probably run away with it because most of the people in Idaho like him. Uh, he's got the name recognition, and I think that he he probably take it. I personally think he is a great Im immigration attorney, and he did good job as our senator or congressman, but I don't see him as a great AG. I think he would probably adapt to it, but he would not Mackenberg be my... Do you think would be better? Huh? Do you think Mackenberg would be better? Than Raul, probably, but I think Colton Ball would be... The only thing Colton Bull has is that he lacks a lot of experience, but he is, uh, I talked to one of his college professors who is a nationwide renowned constitutional lawyer, and he said he is by far the best student he ever had in any of his classes. And he is, he is tenacious, he's like a bulldog, once he, lo once he locks on, He's like a bloodhound once he gets on the scent. And I think that he would do Idaho a great job. I just think that he's got a really hard battle to get out there and get his name out there. But I think Raul will probably take it simply because of the name recognition. I don't think he would be a bad one. I just don't think he'd be a great one. Yeah, and right. and you get the name recognition. They think it's well. It's inevitable. You're going to get it. But bottom line is, the person that God wants to get wants in there. If they step up to the plate, they will be in there. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Yes, sir. Sometime earlier, you had uh, mentioned the idea of people going door to door. I'm curious what you have or are planning to do in terms of uh, creating a statewide network of uh, getting the word out and getting people to realize just how incredibly passionate you are uh, about we're, the world. We're fixing government. to hit social media hard and heavy, and we need people on the ground in the local areas to start getting the name and stuff out there, arranging places where I can go and talk and uh, you're going to see the polls start turning the other way they wouldn't even include my name on the polls and because uh, he's from north idaho we don't want him in south idaho he doesn't fit their their profile that's the same thing they said about jesus that's the same thing they said about ronald reagan and the same thing they said about donald trump 
So when they tell me I don't have a chance, I get excited. Because that's the same thing they told Jesus and Donald Trump. Any other questions? Thanks. Thank you. Steve, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. You can look at my platform uh, at Steve Bradshaw for governor.com. You can see the letter I wrote Brad Little. That'll tell you a lot about the character of Steve Bradshaw. He's a very gentle, humble person, but he speaks his mind. And I will do the best job humanly possible that I can do. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. But a key thing here, and we've heard it several times today, is, you know, you got to vote. You have to get out and vote. You have to find the, you know, the candidates to run, the people you can trust. You know, uh, there's, we're in a, the state's in a world of hurt, and we need to pay attention to what we're doing. And this is our, our opportunity to fix it. We can't, we can't wait any longer. Uh, we don't have much time to lose. So, anyway, with that, thanks everyone. And remember, we are for. <laughs> You that are part of us to come every Wednesday. We are meeting tomorrow too. So we got signs out on the table outside. Oh, um, and we have signs. They can grab some brochures yeah. out of the truck. And, and he has some literature and stuff out out there, signs and stuff yeah, outside. That, uh, if anybody's interested, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. If y'all.